Willkommen Sie, meine Damen und Herren. Der Weltbienentag. Unfortunately, that's the extent of my German. <laughs> but it's very good to be here on World Bee Day. Thank you, Jürgen. I'm going to give a, a talk about some issues in a, in a moment. We'll start the slides. Jürgen asked me to come and speak, or there was some discussion about who asked who to come, but I thought in this beautiful castle, why would I not want to be here? So, uh, yeah, danke. <clears throat> and he gave me this title, or we went back and forth about the title. Beekeeping in a changing world, varroa, climate change, pesticides. And we, we've heard about all these problems. <coughs> But this is World Bee Day. We should be celebrating. So I, I'm not going to talk about any of these things. No, no. I, I will cover some of these things, but then I'll end on a more optimistic note. So yeah, I will. And it looks like the world is ending, right? It's, it's in flames, Armageddon, but it's not. Try again, big button. Okay. Test and short click. Yep. Huh? Short click. <coughs> sometimes. Or. Point in the air. Or point in the air, point, yeah. Try again. Ah, yeah, okay. So this is what we're here to celebrate. And, and, and actually, I will talk about some issues, but bees, bees are what have brought us all together. So it's good to be here, and we're all here because of bees. So, um, uh, yeah. I'll talk briefly about Varroa, because we, I, I was asked to talk about Varroa. Then I'll touch on climate change. Um, and some issues with climate change. We all face climate change. I was hearing about the, the nectar flows here now. You know, feeding, feeding bees in the spring. You don't feed bees in the spring, but now we do. We do. Yeah. And I'll cover a bit about pesticide. Very short. I'll end with more optimism. So if you ask, if you ask people what, what's the problem with my bees, you'll get many, many, many different answers. Some think it's, it's all pesticides or all varroa, whatever. For me, it's three things, and it starts with nutrition. So if we have poor nutrition, the bees are in bad shape, poor nutrition. Poor nutrition, pesticides, and pathogens, I include pests, pests like varroa, pests and pathogens. So these two um, we have to face, but the poor, the poor nutrition, if we have good nutrition, we can help fight that off. So these are what I call the three Ps, the poor nutrition, pesticides, and pathogens. Those are bringing our bees down. And this is, we're, we're going to talk about varroa, little varroa here. But there's other things out there that, as beekeepers, 30 years ago, we, we, we didn't have varroa. And now, in some areas, we have, there's a hornet here at the top. Let's see. Ah, yeah, there's a hornet there. And this is a mite from Asia, tropilalaps. So we, we don't want to talk about <laughs> Problems that aren't here yet. But there was a time before Varroa when, when beekeeping was simpler, when it was easier. And it, it has become more complex. Very briefly, we're, we're not going to have a, a, a lecture with many graphs. In the northern hemisphere, in Europe, America, 
the bees build up in the spring, the mites build up in the fall, and we need to control them, or we try to control them. The bees, however, in other parts of the world, even with Varroa, Africa, Latin America, they don't treat. They, the bees and the mites coexist. So Varroa is primarily a northern hemisphere problem with our European bees. So, because bees inherently have many, many resistance mechanisms, many different ones. Different types of hygienic behavior, specific uh, hygienic behavior, these other things recapping and even damaging or biting mites. So all these things bees can do to, to defend themselves if we give them the opportunity or if, if we breed for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, and we do have, we have control options. And I'll tell you about how I control Varroa in my own operation. These are some more organic options that we know about. And so, I'm, I know many commercial beekeepers use the harder chemicals like Amitraz, but the repeated use of Amitraz, we, we, we come to resistance, the mites become resistant. So, I think the next, yeah, this is my own operation. 150 hives near Washington, D.C. in the States, in the state of Maryland. And yeah, this, I, I went up to 150 this year, so I, I, I grew a little more. There's a, there's a joke, there's only two types of beekeepers. Ones who are going out of business or ones who are expanding. So I'm, I'm expanding, I'm expanding. I have, I have about 150. I po do some pollination, and I only use formic acid, and I use the dribblone oxalic in the fall. And then um, I do some queen rearing, and I just graft from my best stock, the, my best stock. All my, no, not all my bees. Most of my bees, I keep on these trailers to, to save my back. I don't, I don't lift anything. I do have some permanent locations where I just keep them in set locations, and I don't move them. But this is my own operation, and I do use organic acids to control Varroa. And then this is my son, Kevin. It's my wife, Kevin, and I. We run this operation, and we sell all our honey just at three local markets. So we, we have a, a good connection with our consumer. And occasionally, yeah, occasionally we make some very nice comb honey like this, yeah. Occasionally, <laughs> not all the time. Um, so, enough about Varroa. There are very good breeding programs that um, can, can develop stock that overcomes Varroa. I've been looking at a population in France. It's Apis mellifera mellifera. It's not Carnica, it's not Bugfast. Apis mellifera mellifera, and they don't treat, they don't feed, and those bees live. So they have natural resistance, and it, and it is possible. So now, now to climate change, switch, switch to climate change. Uh, yeah. These are just some broad examples of what climate change can do to us or what, how it affects us. Obviously, higher temperatures, you get drought. Ooh. One, yeah. <laughs> or uh, or uh, some kind of uh, microwaves or something. Yeah, ah, we're back. Um, things like forest fires in, in um, Australia and other places big forest fires. This is from my own, this is from, I live, uh, I live right about here in Maryland and Washington DC, uh, somewhere right about there. Anyway, this is a hurricane coming in to North Carolina and Virginia. And so heavy, heavy rains, unpredictable rains. 
I was just in Rome yesterday, and they, have, they were having terrible rains, not in Rome, but in northern Italy. So I was there for World Bee Day celebration. And if you take nothing else from my talk, let's see if it's the next, no, it's not. I'll, 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 I'll get, in a minute, I'll get to that. So forest fires are one example of high temperatures, unpredictability. Many areas of the world, the Middle East, North Africa, becoming hotter and drier. I've done some work on uh, sperm viability in queens, in queen honeybees. And drones, I think, become sterile above about 40 degrees, 40 degrees centigrade. So if it, once the summer gets too hot, the bees can't mate or the, it's no good, yeah. And again, just more intense rains, unpredictable weather. Feed, feeding bees in the spring, yeah. Um, so this is my only take home message other than the joy part. At the end, I'm gonna talk about the joy of beekeeping. You might have learned beekeeping from your father. I don't know, did you learn? No, ah, okay. But someone in the room learned beekeeping from their father or mother, like third generation. And you knew that on May 4th, the nectar flow starts. So you could predict, you do all your management, getting prepared for that day. The nectar flow will start, it'll start. And it's been consistent. The consistency has, has gone away with, with climate change, in my opinion. We can't just follow a schedule. Last fall, my bees did really, really well in the fall. It was a long, slow fall. They brought in a lot of pollen, a lot of nectar. It was beautiful. And I only had, I had less than 18% mortality. I hardly, I didn't feed. It was just beautiful fall. The one before, I was feeding every day, trying to get them, get them heavy. So the calendar no longer works. The only thing that works is looking in the bees and trying to understand where they are. That to me is the big is the big change. So, what one I think this is the only experiment in the thing. I did some work on pollen quality and rising CO two levels, and I'll I'll walk you through it. It's not too complicated. From humans, we know that rising CO two. Some food is not as nutritious so for, um, for humans. And the question was, could the same be true for food for bees? And we chose solidago or goldenrod as the, as the plant to study. So we were gonna study this one plant in the fall for pollen production. And that's the, the citation for it. You, if you want, you can go in and read the paper. But it's basically, we had an opportunity to look at changing CO2 levels and the pollen quality in this one plant. And living in Washington, D.C., we had the I don't see the Smithsonian name is not there. This is the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. And inside they have a herbarium. And we had plants from 1842 to 2014. So this huge plant span of plants that we could sample. So we, we went in, we took small samples from 350 plants 172 years, so this long, huge, um, um, yeah, huge timeline. At the same time, we have records of the CO2, what's happening with the CO2. So we take a small amount of pollen, 1842, and we compare it to the CO2 level. Ah, I won't talk much about this, but we did the same in these tunnels 
We have high CO2 going to lower CO2, and we grow the, grow the plants there experimentally for two years to see what changes as well. And I think this is the only other real graph you have to, you have to suffer through. It's not bad. You can just ignore this for now. It's nitrogen. But I want to focus on estimated protein, the percent protein in pollen. This is in pollen. And these are samples from the 1840s, 1840s coming to 2014. I mean, you see a trend. 1840s up to about 1900. And the trend, the, pop, the protein, the protein's going straight down. And the CO2, here's the CO2 levels. CO2 is low, and now it's higher here in the 2000s. So the pollen quality protein goes down as CO2 goes up. It was very clear. And I think I don't have this thing from the greenhouse, but the greenhouse showed the same thing. This is only one plant. This is one plant, but it's an important fall plant for bees. And so, it wants to stay. There we go. So, I mean, bees only need two things. They need water, too, but they need nectar and pollen. And all the protein they get is from pollen. So this was 30% reduction in a fall, in a fall plant, which is, which is troubling. Because it's, for me, at times, goldenrod is 50% of the pollen coming in for a few weeks. And yet it's less nutritious. I don't know the overall effect. I don't know how much that's affecting bees, but it's not good. It means we need to have a real diverse set of pollen for our bees. So, yeah. And so if this is happening with goldenrod, is it happening with other plants? Is it happening with apple? Is it happening with whatever, any other plant? Who knows? But it could be. It makes sense that it, that it probably is. And then we have the issue, which has already been talked about by Jurgen and everyone else, things like with monocultures and large acres of one crop, the bees don't get a diverse diet anyway. They, don't, they only get a few pollens, and they need diverse pollen. So monocultures and then monocultures also lead to more pesticide exposure in general. This is our, this is the world's, not, not worst example, this is the largest pollination event in the world, it, it, depicting California almonds, two million colonies. I, I didn't know the world needed that much marzipan. I mean, why do we need that much marzipan, right? Um, but actually, no, and I think almonds themselves, the nut consumed is good. But do we need almond milk? I don't know. I mean, almonds as a as a one food source is a very good nutritious nut. But anyway, this is this is what we do. Eighty percent of the world's almonds are produced in, in California. Yeah. Um, ah, I have to go back. Yeah. So I'll switch now a little bit to some pesticide things, just sh briefly. Bees face pesticides all the time. But this is a story of, of a good side that the bees can detect and, and, and understand, or not, they can detect and hide away pesticide, avoid pesticide exposure. So it doesn't show up very well here in the light, but you can see the yellow pollen here. Yellow pollen. Over here is, these are, this is pollen, but it's covered with propolis. So it's covered with propolis. And we came up with a term we call entombed pollen. It's, it's covered with propolis. So here, they're dark, and then the yellow is the, the normal entombed pollen. I mean, this is the normal pollen. This is entombed. We sampled from the same combs. We sample entombed pollen and 
normal pollen, and we analyzed it for pesticides. And that's, that's what's coming next. So remember, it's from the same comb. And I apologize, there was another graph. OK, sorry. I'm, I'm a scientist and a beekeeper, and I'm a lot of different things. Um, this is from the control, the yellow, the yellow pollen. And all of these things, fluvalinate, you will know, cumafos, chlorpyrifos is agricultural chemical. And this is a fungicide, common fungicide. So almost no, almost no detection in the yellow. But look here in the entombed, higher levels. What we think is that the bees were collecting pollen from the field with um, fungicide, and it changed the pollen and even pulled these materials out of the beeswax. So beeswax oh, is lipophilic, and the pesticides sit in the beeswax for a long time. And we think it, it changed it here and pulled the cumafos and fluvalinate into the pollen, into the entombed pollen. Because these are only, on the comb, they're, they're very close by. So it's hard to imagine that somehow fluvalinate and cumafos got into that pollen. Anyway, we think it's, it, there's an interaction. Regardless, it's a good news. The bees detected that those cells were poor. These cells had something wrong, and they covered them with propolis, and they don't eat them. So it's a, it's a good story, in a way. The bees protect themselves from the pesticide. It's not the total answer, but at least they detected something wrong with that pollen, and they entombed it. I have to tell you one more good story about um, bee defenses. These are hornets uh, in Vietnam, in this case. And they're, they're common in Vietnam. And what we have, what's the, what's the one France now moving all over? What's this genus species? Someone knows, I don't know, I can't remember. There's a hornet in, from Asia in France a little bit and moving up into the UK. Coming to Germany soon, I assume. I mean, already here, already here. OK, OK. Velutina, Velutina, thank you. Anyway, good friends of mine, Dr. Gardos and Dr. Um, uh, Madela, Heather Madela, had been working in Vietnam. And they're working with, uh, we, we're Apis mellifera. They're using Apis serrana, Asian honeybee, Apis serrana. So, they kept noticing these spots on the front of the hive, these spots. And they said, what are the spots, different spots? And they said, the spots appear when the hornets appear. So the hornets come, the spots appear. And so they set up a very simple experiment. They went into an apiary, and they cleaned, cleaned the entrance so everything started fresh. And they waited, wait for the hornets to come. The hornets come, and it, maybe it doesn't show up so well. The bees just fill the front of the hive with splotches. Some of you probably know that what it is. It's cow dung, or chicken shit, or caca. What's the, what's the German word for feces? What, what's, what's the German word for feces? Help me out. Huh? Yeah. Shit, shit. And so somehow, when they chicken, cow, I don't know, they, they throw it on the front of the hive, and the hornets get disoriented. They can't, they can't find the hive as well. So it's, it's a defense. It's a fascinating defense that they have. And if you go, if you search on the web and just put in, yeah, cow dung, apis serrana, they have a nice video, them, them putting the material on. It, it's, for me, it's just a good story. The bees have this, yeah, yeah. The bees can, yeah, no, <laughs> maybe, maybe they don't harvest in. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know.
So I'll conclude this part, and then I'll, I'll get to the more joyous part. So we know and we've heard from every, all the previous speakers, bees are vital for our food security. That's why, that's why politicians value beekeepers. Or yeah, I mean, not the only reason, but yeah. So bees and pollination and food security go hand in hand. Um, bees have a lot of natural defense, but it takes time for that defense to come to fruition. There are good breeding programs. Um, and we also, we as beekeepers, have to give them the chance to evolve. We have to work with them to give them the chance to evolve. The rising CO2 level, um, that's worrying. Yeah, this is worrying, but there's, there's not a lot we can do except watch our bees and some of these, some artificial protein diets, we may be having to use those more at certain times of year if there's not protein available. Yeah. For me, and I did, I'm actually old enough, I kept bees before Varroa, so I'm, I'm yeah. But now that, I, now that I'm keeping with Varroa, I still, with Varroa and climate change, I, I, I let the bees tell me what to do. Let, how I, how I can work with them. I don't, I don't try to manipulate them based on my ideas. Yep. And then, yeah, we know that bees and pesticides don't mix. So we really need, and beekeepers can lobby for this, we need to work to diversify agriculture. So we need to work to make agriculture more, more diverse. As Apamundia, we actually put in a request to COP28, coming up in the United Arab Emirates, to talk about how bees could help protect the environment and help, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but it's certainly true that bees can be an important part of, of and, and diversifying agriculture is a big, big way to help there. Uh, yeah, and then my overall conclusions, we have problems. We have all these things. We have habitat destruction, pests and pathogens, pesticides, and climate change. We have, everything is coming at us, but we also, almost every day, we get to wake up and go out and work with bees. So, I mean, it, yeah, so, um, and, and bees are resilient. I mean, bees themselves are resilient. They, they can use different tools and things to fight off. So we should, we should actually celebrate the bees not, 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 not uh, yeah, worry about all the things, all the things that are out there. So I want to end on more of a, ce a celebratory note. Um, a lot of different types of beekeeping. We tend to manage ours in certain boxes and we can move them and we use forklifts and we, uh, all kinds of things. But there's nothing wrong with this kind of beekeeping. This is a very sustainable kind of beekeeping in Africa. This is in Thailand, movable frames. So there's, there's many things around the globe, many different ways of keeping bees, and we need to embrace all that. And, and, and at April Mundia, that's part of our mission is just to embrace the different types of beekeeping. And what it does, I'm speaking to you in English, and I apologize for that, but the bees help us speak the same language. I mean, we all speak bees. Some of us were down at the hives maybe an hour or two hours ago, and there was a swarm, and we all started, I mean, there, I was maybe the only non-German uh, speaking person, but we all started doing things with a swarm, and we all spoke the same language. Ah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really good, and, um, and that's the bees that, that bring us together. Ah, I think this was mentioned. Um, the climate change report it is scary. And we as beekeepers and, and just consumers, we need to be aware of that. We have put in a request to COP28, which is this panel in UAE, to be there and talk about how bees can improve people's lives. And if people, indigenous people and others who are living in the forest can use bees, then they can turn around and help protect that forest. 
in the, in the forest or the Amazon, but even in dry areas. If beekeepers can, can work in areas and protect it, it can go a long way for uh, protecting part of the environment. And then, um, yeah, because we don't think about this every day in Northern Hemisphere and developed nations, but beekeeping, it's non-extractive, it's compatible with all kinds of conservation efforts. And again, we don't think about this so much. Honey and beeswax, in the developing world, they're stable products. They don't need refrigeration. They can get them to market. Yeah, and propolis, yeah. So for people in developing world, it's a great source of income, and we're working to promote that. So, yeah. Um, a little bit, a little bit of Apamundia salesmanship, if you will. Not, not much. So we meet all over the globe. Uh, this is Montpellier, I think, in France. It was a very good meeting. Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we met in Ukraine, back under more peaceful circumstances. So we move around the globe. Uh, we would be delighted to have a um, uh, a bid, a bid for 29 from Germany. But know that there probably there could be other bids, so you have to be prepared. Have a good city, a good city that people want to come to. Good, good beekeeping, which is evident. Um, and then just lastly, we work on many different things, but one of the things we work on is honey fraud, because milk is number one, olive oil is number two, and honey's the third most adulterated product in the world. It, it, yeah, it's very widespread. Um, so, and with that, I'll close. I'll welcome you. Santiago, Chile is coming right up. It's coming right up in, in uh, September. Right now, September 23. But if you can't make that, you just need to buy a train ticket. You just buy a train ticket. And you can lower your carbon footprint and come to Copenhagen, Denmark in 25. And let's see about 29. Let's, uh, let's, I'll look forward to seeing a bid for 2029. So, uh, Dankeschön. Ah, I, I have to close, yeah. It's World Bee Day, and in Rome, in Rome, I, I gave people a challenge. I said, for World Bee Day, look for a native tree, native flowers, native bush, something native, and go out and get your hands dirty. So the best thing you can do is go out and plant something. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be today, but for World Bee Day, think about planting a native tree or native thing. So plant a tree and help save bees. Thank you.